let's start um, and I'll let people in as, as they apply. Um, my name is Edward Hutchison. I'm a landscape architect and an architect, but now primarily I'm an artist. Um, on the 20th of November last year, a small group of us thought that we should uh, uh, approach the um, pressing issues surrounding landscape. And we thought it would be really good to open up the general discussion about the, these issues. So to do this, uh, we launched this um, <clears throat> magazine called Landscape Matters. It seemed to us to be really important that it should be punchy in its content and also punchy visually. It's going to come out um, four times a year. Uh, it's completely free. Um, and we would like it to embrace a whole range of different subjects, not only landscape planning, not only landscape science, not only landscape design, but poetry, art, um, ploughing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, with the intention of basically trying to break down the, the, the intellectual <laughs> silos which can surround the subject of landscape. And we, the first, it was uh, first came out on the um, 17th of January, and I'm pleased to say that our readership at the moment is 1,800 people, um, mm -hmm. of which. 20% is uh, overseas. We've got um, 12 readers in New Zealand. Um, and uh, so this basically, these um, debates are to run parallel um, with, with our magazine. In other words, we, we won't have the same subjects, but they obviously the debates are free. And we would like these debates to, to have a sort of function and a purpose that they will all be recorded um, notes will be taken, and in this instance, um, Tom Robinson's going to well, transcribe the, the notes from the recording, and everybody will be issued the notes from this meeting um, with recommendations, and those recommendations will be sent to whoever we feel is appropriate. Um, and obviously the Landscape Institute will be, of course, set said these um, uh, recommendations. Um, in the 1980s, the Evening Standard ran a series of uh, debates, I think there were about eight or nine of them, uh, about the future of London. And these, in a way, was the sort of model which we had for, for this debate, in the sense that these Evening Standard debates were open to anybody. Um, they were completely free, and the subjects were presented by experts. And, um, for example, there was one debate on the unlikely subject of should London have a mayor? And at the time, it, that seemed to be not exactly far-fetched, but a long way away. Um, but the, what was magic about these debates, that it felt a Grecian in the sense that anybody could enter it and anybody could contribute it, to it. And in the same way, we'd like these debates, with this being the first, um, to be open to anybody, anybody can make a contribution, and who knows what the uh, end result will be. So, I'm extremely grateful that 120 people replied and 75 people in, are with us at the moment. Um, what we, again, the, 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 we would like to make this a, a, a debate as opposed to a webinar as much as possible. So it'll be on in four parts. The first part after I've spoken. Well, um, <clears throat> Tony Edwards, um, who is uh, a, a landscape architect, he will chair the, the, the meeting, the technical side of the meeting. Um, so he'll make an introduction to um, the, the subject from his aspect. Um, then each speaker, we've got four speakers, each speaker will um, introduce their particular aspect which they're interested in. Um, then we will have a, 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 a sorry, quest, during these um, presentations, questions could be submitted in the usual sort of way to the chat box. And then Tony Edwards will have the unenviable task of taking questions out of the chat box um, and then putting those questions to um, the speakers. Um, then Mark Van Griegen has very kindly agreed that he will um, give his summary, being a, an author of um, the GLVIA uh, number three. And then after that, um, if everyone's got the appetite, uh, we'd like to open the, the, the debate to the floor so it becomes, as it were, much less controlled. Um, 
So the first, very, very briefly, um, Tom Robinson, who basically, he, it was his idea to have this subject as a, as a debate, because he and um, Charlie Banner known each other for a long time and shared car journeys together and, and alcoholic dinners together and have felt very impassioned um, about the subject. Um, Tom, Tom is a landscape architect. He f first of all worked for local authority and then um, ran Brian Clouston's office um, in Durham and then Tom set up his own practice. After that, the second speaker is Sally Marsh. Sally Marsh is a landscape ecologist. Um, she is director of the High Wield AONB partnership, and she's been there for 25 years. And she has been involved in reviewing LBIAs, and the landscape character assessment and landscape sensitivity studies over 15 uh, local authorities. She's currently studying for a PhD with the University of Kent, looking at the meaning and measurement of natural beauty. Um, Claire writes very poetically, so I'll just read out what she's written. I've always been interested in landscape, recognizing from an early age that places which shaped my childhood and ultimately my career were very distinct and different. I spent my youth outdoors, observing the changing seasons and the effect land use had on the character of our surroundings. I was intrigued by how the differences occurred and studying the physical geography helped me to develop my knowledge and further ignite my interests. Uh, now, as I've scaled back my work, being a cell practitioner, I have more time to reflect on what I do and possibly the profession and how I can do better and make the process of LBIA more valuable to our clients and the landscape within which we work. And then finally, Charlie Banner, um, who, who will be the last speaker. He is a barrister at Keating Chambers with an experience of 110 planning inquiries, the majority of which have involved landscape or townscape and visual issues, both within and outside the designated landscapes. He has worked with and has cross-examined a considerable number of landscape experts. He has a non-executive board position at the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors and the Joint Natural Conservation Committee, and is the creator and co-presenter of the high-profile planning-related webcast, Have We Got Planning News For You? Now, I'm now going to try and uh, hand over to Tony Edwards. Um, so Tony Edwards is now host. Okay, right. Um, we'll get started. I hope the, uh, the technology works well and um, apologize for any glitches. Um, in talking about guidelines for landscape and visual impact assessment, we have an interesting topic to debate and uh, like you, I cannot wait to hear what I'm going to say really. Um, I'd like to set the scene as it were in some form of chronological order before you hear the papers of our valued contributors. As a short summary, a GLBIA assessment is the, looking at the expected change of view from a number of designated receptor viewpoints. However, there is a long established principle in land law that an owner cannot protect a view from a property unless the landowner can rely on a specific covenant to protect it. First recorded in 1610 in Alred's case, it was established that the right to a view is too broad to qualify as an easement and a right must be sufficiently definite. This position has become an accepted fundamental in planning law and there is no right to a view under the planning system. This has sometimes become a contentious point of law, specifically for local objectors in relation to visual impact assessment. Environmental assessment arrived in the UK via the EU EIA directive of 1985 which has been subsequently amended four times in 1997, 2003, 2009, and 2014. The most recent amendment came into force to simplify the rules for assessing the potential effects of projects on the environment. The LIGLBIA guidance was first published in 1995. As stated in the foreword to the second edition, no public inquiry into planning matters seems complete without the guidelines being waved in the air. That said, techniques and government policy, which I'll come back to, continue to develop and the guidelines need to keep abreast of developing legislation and new techniques. 
from a robust testing of the first edition, we now have the next stage in the ongoing evolution of landscape and visual assessment, which again, we may come back to. This process continues and the third edition was published in April 2013. A residential visual amenity assessment, an RVAA technical guidance note was published in 2019. And then in June 2019, the LI published technical guidance on the visual representation development proposals, which was followed by the guidance reviewing landscape and visual impact assessments and landscape and visual appraisals, technical guidance note 120. Um, so I doubt many people have had much chance to use that over the last year. In the RVAA note, it was stated, residential visual amenity assessment is distinct from LVIA as noted in GLVIA 3 at paragraph 617, which states, effects of development on private property are frequently dealt with mainly through residential amenity assessments. These are separate from LVIA, although visual effects assessment may sometimes be carried out as part of a residential amenity assessment, in which case this will supplement and form part of the normal LVIA pro project. As stated at one public inquiry, the planning inspector stated the test then as follows. I consider when assessing the effect on visual outlook, if it is helpful to pose the question, would the proposal affect the outlook of those residents to such an extent, i.e. be so unpleasant, overwhelming and oppressive that this would become an unattractive place to live? So that was the assessment uh, objectively as far as possible made for the RVAA. Coming up to date, we now have the position in the government consultative white paper, Planning for the Future, which was issued in August 2020, which makes its agenda clear. On Proposal 16, it states, we intend to design a quicker, simpler framework for assessing environmental impacts and enhancement opportunities that speeds up the process while protecting and enhancing the most valuable and important habitats and species in England. So you can see the agenda from a build, build, build government. They want to speed things up and only really protect and enhance the most valuable, important habitats, which leaves lower designations perhaps vulnerable. And paragraph 328 says, requirements for environmental assessment and mitigation need to be simpler to understand and consolidated in one place so far as possible, so that the same impacts and opportunities do not need to be considered twice. So we come to the position in post-Brexit 2021 that a document that has been published in three versions together with legislation which has been amended every six years may be subject to change within a raft of UK planning changes. As the government has flagged up its intentions for a quicker and simpler agenda for environmental assessment, will procedural changes be revolutionary or revolutionary? Hence the appropriateness for the landscape matters debate. So perhaps I can hand over to our first speaker, Tom, to take the floor, as it were. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tony, and good afternoon, everybody. These last few years, there's been a growing concern about the quality of what's being written and said on LVIA under the banner of Glivia 3, because too many of these documents are jargon oppressed, procedurally opaque, hard to read, and imperative in judgment on matters that are properly contingent. We've all seen how contested planning decisions with landscape issues can lead to the commissioning of pro and anti-development LVIAs, an argument over methodology between professionals that is invariably ungenerous and so is unseemly. And I have seen how other professionals and inspectors discount LVIA determinations as subjective. This is bad for the profession, bad for the subject and not very helpful to the planning process. The Institute's aware of this and in recent months has organised open webinars and panel discussions on how to improve procedures. And from this, we seem to have three schools of thought. Some think Glivia 3 is fine and we only need to train professionals in its use. Some think some amendments to the text are required and some think we need both. I'm of the last opinion and so I want to make a few suggestions about how I think Glivia 3 could be improved and they fall into three related areas. The first is the need to work from a shared sensibility and understanding of priorities. Glivia 3 sets out a methodology, but without a common sensibility and understanding of priorities, conclusions can uh, vary widely. 
Now, I've got a quotation here from a recent LVIA on an edge of town housing scheme. I didn't write it. And it goes, with regard to housing developments, there is a broad spectrum of opinion as to whether the effect of housing developments can ever be deemed to be anything other than negative. Therefore, this LVIA will generally assume the housing and roads are adverse effects. Now, this strikes me as wrong-headed in every way. If we are to adopt an a priori anti-housing or anti-development bias in our assessments, why bother writing anything at all? This may be an extreme example, but I think it's common to find marginal changes in the landscape that are being described in absolute terms as major and adverse when the proposed change is from one locally existing landscape types, say green fields, to another residential streets and gardens. This seems to me inflated in language and in judgment. I believe a proper basis for any evaluation of change in the landscape can only come from referencing core planning documents. And my list of these would include the layers of landscape character assessment at national, regional and county level that define the landscape types and character areas. These are quoted at length in LVIAs, but are not always used to determine the appropriateness of a landscape change proposed. The other is the European Landscape Convention, which affirms that landscapes include all land areas in which humans have interacted with the natural world. And so we need to recognize, for example, that the building of housing is a change in landscape type and not the destruction of landscape itself, unless it is done badly, destroys recognized landscape features or is out of context. Then we come to NPPF. This this is central, I think, because it sets out the landscape and visual issues of planning concern, and it indicates some broad principles for their assessment and how to avoid significant impacts. And finally, would be local and neighborhood plans and relevant management or conservation plans that apply to the area of study. There is no place for a predetermined position on the effect of a change. Developing a shared sensibility will take some time, but it can be done by adding technical notes or by training. But at present, Glivia 3 pays only lip service to the ELC and completely ignores the existence of a national planning policy framework, now in its third iteration, for England and Wales. And this seems to be, to be wholly incorrect. And the reasons given for the absence of any reference to the planning context that policy can change, they're just a feat. The second improvement would be to make LVIAs more informative and less judgmental. What distinguishes LVIAs from other types of documents that are used in the planning process is the imperative and judgmental nature of its conclusions. With judgments such as major, permanent, adverse, significant of landscape, landscape effect being quite common judgments. This declaratory approach is a spillover, I think, from the AIA process, where it is the purpose of the assessment to identify significant impacts and the degree of harm that can be caused by these impacts. But most LVIA work is not at AIA level. Livia 3 makes a distinction between AIA and non-AIA work in its recommendation to restrict the use of the term significance to AIAs only because the term has a specific AIA meaning. But NPPF uses the term significant, significance, significantly with regard to impacts, and it's not using them in the AIA sense because it makes clear that while AIAs offer certain types of project, its recommendations on significant impacts apply to all plans and all decisions. Well, what then is NPPF significance in an LVIA? I think the term connotes the idea of a threshold of scale and importance of impact below which something cannot be significant. If that is the case, LVIAs below environmental assessment procedures should distinct be distinguishing between NPPF significant impacts and those that are not. And since NPPF understands that some change will not meet that threshold, this calls into question a methodology that assesses all impacts as if they are significant and requiring judgments about the positive and negative nature of the change. 
Many changes to a landscape are neither good nor bad in themselves. They're just changes from one type to another. And Glivia should recognize this more than it does. And it should concentrate more on the analysis of the change and its effect on, for example, specific landscape features of that are affected by development rather than an overall judgment of the development itself. I think this would improve planning decisions at all levels and could lead the way to this assessment being used to actually improve development. After all, isn't the landscape architect's judgment about landscape change just begging the planning question that an LVIA is meant to inform? The final change that I would like to see is the use of plain English in a more transparent method. Unfortunately, the other distinguishing feature of LVIA is the methodology that scales magnitudes of effect against sensitivities of the receptor to determine the significance or importance of the predicted effect. I don't think this is as helpful to the planning process as it, as it could be. It's quick to the point of being flip. It encourages adversarial reports that result in disputes about methodology, and it takes from the readability of those reports. It's also a pig. Assessing landscape sensitivity, as recent work by Christine Tudor of Natural England attests, is recognized as requiring an assessment of the susceptibility of a landscape to the development proposed and an assessment of landscape value. But Glivia 3 requires the professional to combine these two qualities to determine overall sensitivity of some aspect of the landscape. And this is impossible to do in a transparent matter manner because the two qualities are incommensurable they share no common <coughs> means of measure this makes the result term sensitivity seem more like a construct than an actual quality of a landscape i believe it would be better were we to assess susceptibility and value separately the former susceptibility is capable of comprehensive analysis of both landscape elements and landscape character and this could be used as an analytical tool to improve on site design rather than rather in the way that ecological studies are used to improve site design and the latter value is actually one of those features of the landscape that nppf is concerned about we should thus be analyzing directly and plainly the different forms by which a landscape can be valued that's my gallop and in conclusion i'll say these changes could make LVIAs more accessible and better able to be understood, and that would undoubtedly be an improvement on the utility of this assessment in the planning process. And since these changes combine a change to method as well as attitude, it suggests to me the need for a revision to the current text. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, can we ask Sally Marsh to join in now? We'll take questions at the end rather than between each speaker, just to kind of keep momentum. So perhaps we could ask Sally to uh, launch you to her paper. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, I'm going to talk about LVIAs and natural beauty. So LVIAs and LVAs, and I'll use LVIA to cover both from now on, are the standard industry tools for assessing impact of development on areas of outstanding natural beauty for planning purposes. But do they get it right? The National Family of AOMBs is concerned about what appears to be a consistent downgrading of AOMB impact. And in order to test this, I set up a small systematic review of LVIA judgments. And I wanted to share some early findings with you. So in this study, I'm looking at all LVIAs submitted in support of planning applications in five local authorities in the same AOMB between 2018 and 2020. All of the housing on Greenfield sites affecting in total 90 hectares of land with a potential for 1,200 dwellings. So the first thing I did was upload all the LVIAs into a corpus software to see how they treated the term beauty out a total of 390,000 words, and as someone mentioned earlier, these are big reports, beauty was only mentioned 293 times, mostly in relation to either the name, area of outstanding natural beauty, or the purpose, conserving and enhancing natural beauty. There were only a handful of independent references to beauty 
all of them statements, none of which involved any discussion. So my talk could end there. LVIAs do not concern themselves with beauty or natural beauty. Only, of course, they do, or they claim to. So all these assessments provided statements about AOMB impact. And all of their conclusions, whether for two houses or 400 houses, were the same. The impact of development on the AOMB was minor and negligible. So this reminds me of the torturous paradox. And for those of you who don't know it, it goes like this. There are a thousand torturers and they each torture one victim a thousand times. The torturers can't sleep knowing that they're responsible for the screams of the victims. So to ease their pain, they decide to torture each victim only once. The victims still scream, but the torturers can sleep safe in the knowledge that their action was not the one to cause the victim any harm. Now we know that natural beauty is difficult to quantify, but common sense tells us that there is harm from building on green fields. That doesn't mean that all development should be refused, but there is the potential for harm. So why aren't LVIAs recognising this? The part of the problem is with the method itself, and Tom touched on some of those issues. But I want to look at two key principles that underlie the impact assessment method, vagueness and uncertainty. So we'll take vagueness first. We can't easily put a number, of, a number on factors such as landscape value, sensitivity or impact. So the assessment method uses a form of fuzzy logic. And again, Tom touched on this. So rather than numbers, it uses wide bins with magnifier layers such as high, medium and low. These factors are then weighted and aggregated. Value combined with susceptibility gives a sensitivity. Three sub-factors combine to give magnitude. Sensitivity combined with magnitude gives a significance, et cetera, et cetera. You'll be well aware of how it works. There is a lot riding here on operator judgment with plenty of opportunities for subconscious bias and gaming. And that's exactly what we see. Half of the factors, are, half of the factor scales are weighted negatively in the studies that I looked at and judgments are consistently nudged downwards. So let's look, let's look at the other underlying principle, uncertainty. So the final statements about AOMB impact are made with conviction, yet they rely on mitigation measures to offset harm that exist only on a drawing or in the head of the designer. So how probable is it that these enhancements claimed are achieved in the future? Is it 75%, 50%, 20% likely? We don't know. If landscape practices were obliged to set out the assumptions behind such statements, we might read in LVIAs a paragraph which goes something like this. The landscape enhancement plan might enhance the AMB after 15 years if the contractors manage to avoid running over soil in wet weather with heavy machinery, if sufficient local provenance wildflower seed is available for restoration, if sufficient money is secured for enforcement, management and monitoring, and if the new development doesn't introduce more cats, lighting and disturbance. Now, in the absence of an uncertainty factor, this would be more honest. So, of course, as designers, we believe our schemes are good. But if we can't be honest about adverse impacts, our starting point is wrong. So perhaps, unfortunately, perhaps the most disappointing fund, finding from my study is the overwhelmingly visual bias of every single assessment. The average number of visual receptors are twice that for landscape receptors, despite GLVIA3's strong emphasis on equal treatment. But the visual bias is even more pernicious than this imbalance implies. Since the majority of the landscape receptors are either character areas or features where impact is discussed in terms of visual properties only. 
out of 140 receptors in this study, only two are grassland. So 104 landscape receptors, only two are grassland. Only one, a historic landscape feature associated with grassland and one agricultural land. Not a single receptor looked below ground at the soil. I find this shocking. All of the sites reviewed, bar one, are permanent pasture, most likely sitting in historic field systems on relatively undisturbed soil. All these sites have the potential to store carbon, produce food, employ labor, and or rewild for nature in perpetuity in their current state. So what does this, what do these findings say about our profession? I suggest, suggest to you we are fixated on the visual at the expense of landscape as a resource, and yet we still can't really talk about beauty. Yeah. Like landscape, natural beauty has both a subjective component as well as an object, and arguably a moral dimension. Its definition in law is as much about the material landscape as it is about the pleasure of experiencing it. And landscape as a resource underpins the three biggest challenges facing our global society, the climate crisis, biodiversity loss and social inequality. And by the latter, I mean fair access to affordable housing, safe food, clean water and to nature for well-being. So if we as a profession can't deal with landscape as a resource properly, we will have no voice in the future. And I suggest to you that young people will not hasten to join us. So I started this research with the view that LVIA guidance and practice needed to be refined, but I'm not sure this is enough. It may need a completely fresh approach. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Um, Claire, would you like to deliver your paper now? Thank you. Yes, um, I suppose coming sort of the fifth person to speak, I tend to not have a paper, but more ramblings, which follow my own thoughts on GLVIA and the relationship to design, but also picking up some of the points that Tom and Sally have um, mentioned. So from, from my perspective, um, regardless of the GLVIA and whether we should have a new guidance, should it be updated, those sorts of things. I think one of the issues for me is the emphasis and the relationship between the baseline assessment process and the outcome for the design. So a bit like the previous speakers, I think I my experience both in terms of producing and reviewing LVIAs is there is a huge amount of time and effort spent articulating the minutiae of difference between sensitivity and value and susceptibility. We engage in the process of concluding on and categorizing significance of effect and from my perspective we don't often see the true findings of the baseline analysis um, expressed through the master plan or the scheme development um, uh, which is the subject of the planning um, application so i think from my point of view is it is a this, this is all referenced in the current uh, version, and it's one chapter, chapter four of the guidance, which is very rarely waved about at inquiry, which contains the links between understanding the character, the sense of place, the qualities and the components of the landscape that make that distinct, that special, um, that, that value, and then translating that into the right design for that location. And so it should be for the reader of, a, of an LVIA sitting alongside the master plan saying, I may not want development to happen, but I can absolutely understand why it is coming forward in this form, in this way, as this type of response for this landscape, because if I read, the baseline analysis, I totally understand how we've got to this point. And sometimes I'm afraid I do 
get to work on projects where somebody else has been involved with the LBIA process. And I read the LBIA and I look at the master plan and there is a disconnect. And I think as a profession, we need to get tougher and more robust within our design teams to press for the right outcome. But we need to ensure that our information, our analysis at the very outside, outset of the project gets delivered and reminded to the team throughout the evolution and iteration of the scheme proposals. So I think that from my point of view, I would love to see the LBIAs that we produce structured differently whereby instead of baseline, let's start classifying very early on in the process what the susceptibility is, what the value is, what the sensitivity is, and now let's jump into the assessment process and then we'll just touch on this bolt-on mitigation. I would love it if we're actually describing the baseline, how that informs the initial approach to a landscape-led solution and how throughout each iteration of the master plan those matters were tested and refined and improved upon because it makes it much easier to write an assessment when you know that the scheme you have is the best it can possibly be so i think from my point of view the inquiry process that we have and we have had has meant that we're, we're kind of falling into a cycle, which is you produce an LVIA, it gets debated, your methodology gets debated ad nauseum in an inquiry. You go away, you learn your lessons, you tighten up your criteria, you put some more text in, you try and clarify all of that, and then you go back to an inquiry and you do it again. I appear at quite a large number of inquiries and sadly I think and it's an expression of what we are achieving is the debate tends to be about the methodology we've adopted in classifying the significance of effect and very rarely is the scheme and the design the subject of the debate the subject of the examination if you said this was important in the baseline why aren't we seeing it in the master plan so I think it's that disconnect. So my contribution to the debate is how do we restore that connection? How do we make it that the landscape profession's role is intrinsic early on and can't be done by someone else because it's not sufficiently formulaic? So it's that, that area where I would like to see either a change in emphasis in any guidance, but also a a period of reflection for the profession to actually see is that what we're trying to do because if all we're trying to do is agree some way of describing effects as opposed to ensuring that we deliver the best design outcomes and i think we have a debate on the guidance and where we go and what we're seeking to achieve as a profession thank you very much claire um that's very interesting um now our final speaker charlie banner qc um can we ask you to give us your thoughts please thank you edward uh, and, and good evening everybody thank you for inviting me to participate in this discussion a as you all know I i'm of course not a, a landscape professional myself but i've greatly enjoyed working with and indeed against um several landscape professionals some of whom i'm very pleased to see here today uh, over about 15 years or so as acting as a planning quite level uh, and typically, uh, this involves reviewing evidence prepared by the landscape expert on my side and testing the evidence of the opposing side's expert through cross-examination. And in both contexts, of course, Glivia 3 is, is the governing framework. Uh, and now, a, a large part of my work involves proposals for residential development on, on greenfield sites. And I should say at the outset, I don't only act for the promoters of such development, but often also for the local planning authorities responsible for considering them, as I am indeed this week. Uh, we have a, a national housing crisis. Uh, the government wants to build 300,000 new homes per year. A national planning policy, which in turn informs local plans, uh, has been designed to achieve this. Uh, it's inevitable, and I think universally acknowledged, that a significant proportion of these new homes will have to be located on greenfield sites. Even the most ardent supporters of a ground field first approach accept that brownfield sites on their own can't deliver anything like the numbers needed to address the housing crisis. 
So from a planning policy perspective, therefore, the question in relation to greenfield development is not whether or not it should happen or whether it is in principle beneficial or detrimental. The focus instead is on ensuring the right amount and the right kind of development happens on the right greenfield sites. Why is this of any relevance at all to Glivia? Well, to answer this, I suggest it's necessary to appreciate what is the purpose of landscape and visual assessment or landscape and visual impact assessment. The assessment is not, I suggest, an abstract academic exercise, some kind of PhD. It, its purpose is to inform a decision. And in the context of greenfield residential development, that decision I outlined a moment ago, is this the right amount and the right kind of development on the right greenfield site? Not is greenfield development in principle for the good or for the bad? And herein lies the main difficulty I've seen with how Glivia 3 is applied in practice. The way it's applied uh, by most landscape professionals and decision makers, and there are exceptions, um, and by decision makers I mean both PINs, inspectors and local authority officers. The way it's applied by them is, is that any new built form on greenfield land will be deemed adverse in landscape character terms due to uh, the loss of rural or similar character and to the extent that it's visible it will be deemed to cause an adverse visual effect broadly speaking because visible built form is to be introduced where none currently is and that's deemed to be a bad thing in principle and accordingly the assessment which is intended to inform a decision not as to whether or not greenfield development is in principle good or bad but a decision whether this is the right amount and the right kind of development in the right place that assessment is focusing on considering how much of a bad thing is this? Now, if that is how Glivia 3 is to be applied, there's a mismatch between the methodological framework within the landscape assessment is to be undertaken and the policy framework within which the decision, which that assessment informs, is to be undertaken. Now, it might be said in advance, well, Glivia 3 does in fact permit a decision that landscape and visual changes are beneficial or neutral rather than necessarily negative. So in relation to landscape character, paragraph 5.37 provides, and I'm probably telling you what you already know, one of the more challenging issues I'm quoting is, is deciding whether the landscape effects should be categorised as positive or negative. It's also possible for effects to be neutral in their consequences for the landscape and informed professional judgment should be made about this. And the criteria for reaching the judgment should be clearly stated. They might include, but shouldn't be restricted to, the degree to which the proposal fits within existing character, the contribution to the landscape the development may make in its own right, usually by virtue of good design, even if it is contrast with existing character. And in relation to visual effects, paragraph 6.29 provides, and again, sorry for telling you what you already know, um, as with landscape effects, an informed professional judgment should be made as to uh, whether the visual effects can be described as positive or negative, or in some cases neutral, in their consequences for use and visual amenity. This will need to be based on a judgment about whether the changes will affect the quality of the visual experience for those groups of people who will see the changes given the nature of the existing views. In practice, however, um, any prospect um, that these paragraphs would enable new housing development on a greenfield site to be judged beneficial or indeed neutral, either in relation to landscape character or in relation to visual effect, is in my experience largely, if not wholly, illusory. Neither paragraph offers any real steer on how the effects of such development could be judged to be positive or neutral. And the reality is, in practice, that the overwhelming majority of landscape professionals and planning inspectors I've encountered would consider that new built development doesn't fit with an existing character of a greenfield site and thus can't be positive or neutral in character terms and that it negatively affects the quality of the visual experience compared to unbuilt greenfield and therefore thus can't be positive or neutral. And to give just one example, when I acted for Carla Homes, who are known for the high quality design of their homes, um, promoting a residential development on an allocated greenfield site in a place called Hermitage in Berkshire. And my landscape witness, Andy Cook, uh, relied upon those two paragraphs I just quoted to argue that the impacts of this high quality scheme are what was at the time a, an unremarkable, and I repeat, allocated piece of inaccessible scrubland, no rights of life, truly scrubland. Um, he, he sought to argue that the effects would be positive. The inspector's response was withering. He said, I disagree with the basic 
premise, and I'm quoting the inspector here, just to agree with the basic premise of Mr. Cook's assessment, namely that the majority of the landscape and visual impacts described would be beneficial. In large part, this conclusion results from his view expressed at the inquiry that in this location, the housing proposed would be of a type and quality that would have a neutral effect, and the scheme's green infrastructure elements, uh, notably the removal of the alien conifers and introduction of new boundary planting, would create a net benefit. In respect to the scheme's housing element, I don't accept Mr. Cook's assertion that the effect of the proposed housing would be neutral in landscape and visual terms, irrespective of the design quality of the individual dwellings and subject to the effect of the intended green infrastructure, the presence of housing within the appeal site, together with the suburbanizing effects of roads, drives, fences, and ancillary domestic buildings, would act to generally detract from the site's rural character. Now, these so-called suburbanizing features are, of course, common to any housing development. It's a, it's a stick you could beat any scheme with. They weren't unique to that particular scheme. And there are countless other cases I've been involved in where a similar approach was taken. And to illustrate the point further, I, I truly wonder how many landscape professionals participating in today's discussion would be prepared in principle to, include, to conclude, applying Glivia 3, that the following three kinds of development on a greenfield site are capable in principle of causing positive or neutral effects rather than adverse effects. So example number one, three affordable, sorry, 30 affordable homes in the local vernacular on the edge of a village in the Lake District, visible as indeed any edge of settlement development in that part of the country would be from the many public rights of way in the vicinity. Example number two, a well-designed housing scheme in an AONB where the AONB management plan references high quality built environment as one of the special qualities of the AONB. And thirdly, a paragraph 79, formerly paragraph 55, dwelling prominent for all to see on formerly virgin land, but of exceptional and innovative design thus supported by national planning policy. Now it seems to me inherently odd that in a world where decisions are being taken, premise that more housing, including appropriate schemes on appropriate greenfield sites, is a good thing, the assessment of landscape and visual effects of such schemes is in practice constrained to asking how bad they are. Um, there's also an increasing tension between this approach and the government's push towards higher quality design, the building beautiful agenda. You can't build beautiful if you can't build at all. Uh, accordingly, if a new Glivia uh, addition is to be prepared at some point in future. I, I would personally welcome greater clarity that uh, new housing development on greenfield sites is capable in principle of being treated as something which contributes positively to landscape character and visual effects, subject, of course, to case specific factors such as location, scale and design. It's not to say every scheme would be positive. That's plainly not correct, but it could in principle be. And now that greater clarity could be achieved in a number of ways. It could be achieved by amending or augmenting paragraphs 5.37 and 6.29, perhaps in combination with greater emphasis on the importance of considering a greenfield site's capacity for change, starting from the premise that some, albeit by no means all, greenfield sites do have such capacity. A further alternative way of doing it would be for Glivia 4, uh, if it happens in future, to, to have a greater focus on outcome, end result, rather than on change, before versus after. Even Blenheim Palace was a greenfield once, <laughs> and it's a genuine national treasure now, recognised by all. But at the time it was proposed, um, if there was a, to have been a change-focused LVA, I'd wager that it would have predicted major adverse impacts. Surely what is more important is its contribution to the landscape character and its contribution to the vision environment once built, irrespective of what was there before. Now, some of you may, may retort, well, such a refinement to Glivia to bring it more in line with the decision-making context which, within which LVAs and LVAs are undertaken, dare I say provocatively, more in line with reality, um, that this would compromise the independence of the landscape profession. Well, um, Obviously, acknowledging I'm not a landscape professional, but I respectfully suggest on the outside that would not uh, be the case. A refined uh, version of Glivia along the lines I've outlined would still allow for independent professional judgment to be reached, and it wouldn't involve landscape professionals straying into the planning merits. It would, I suggest, be little different from the decision of the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, on whose board I sit, um, to update its financial viability and planning standards 
in light of changes to the National Planning Policy Framework and Planning Practice Guidance, which enshrined a, a particular approach to valuation, the existing use value plus, um, which was inconsistent with um, some uh, theories of established valuation approach. And the update to the RIC standard was done so that the methodology used by RIC's valuers was in keeping with, not in tension with, the policy framework governing the decisions within which uh, those valuations operated. Perhaps most importantly, uh, what such a refinement would do is ensure that the landscape professional doesn't operate in some kind of parallel universe to planning. Um, and in doing so, this would surely, I suggest, secure the, the continuing importance and considerable value that the profession plays in helping to ensure that the right development happens in the right places. So those are my thoughts, and I look forward to the ongoing discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlie. Um, well, there are a number of points that people have uh, raised. Um, perhaps I can just say whether the panel agree that um, it is not, as um, Chris has just said, it, it's no GLVIA is not just about the view, the impacts on the landscape must be looked at as well, which I think is mm -hmm. his point, that it's probably too narrow a way of looking at things to simply only be worried about the view instead of the totality of the landscape as well. Um, and that may be, um, we, we're spending too much time worrying about the visual effects and probably not an enough holistic view about it, but maybe that's the brief that we get and we need to actually look at a revision if people feel it's necessary to ensure that um, it doesn't become the be all and end of all of a landscape assessment as well. Uh, another query from Sarah directly to Sally, um, do you equate the term beauty with scenic quality as this all seems to be one of the criteria making judgments on sensitivity? Um, beauty is quite a live issue at the moment um, on the after the build better build beautiful commission and all of that's being fed into design codes at the moment which are out for consultation uh, sometimes I say well designed sometimes I say places must be beautiful so do you find yourself on the horns of a dilemma in defining beauty can I ask you Sally on that one was that for, was that for me Tony yeah <laughs> yeah just to say I mean scenic scenic quality is only a very small aspect of natural beauty. I mean, bear in mind, I'm talking about natural beauty, not necessarily beauty generally, but in terms of the sort of the legal purpose behind uh, the designation of natural beauty. It wasn't just about scenery or scenic, scenic quality. It was about the material landscape, about ecological functioning, about wildlife, um, and about sort of iconic landscape character, as well as about you know the beauty um, and the pleasure that people experience by being in landscape you know a and b's were the natural health service to mirror the you know the national health service at, at the time hmm. so i mean one of the one of the problems about beauty is that um you know it's, it's a it's a philosophical issue depending on how you approach beauty yeah you know, whether it's in the eye of the beholder whether it's about um the object and the subject so that's a that's something for a, a, another discussion i suggest um, yes, it's, it's true. I mean, I don't think we can accept that blocks of flats, which we're going to need to build, can actually be beautiful either in the built environment. You know, that's equally a struggle, I think, to, although that's been a popular phrase. Um, another query was uh, from Charlotte. Is a, should valued landscapes be designated in local plans? Um, I don't know whether, Charlie, your life would be made easier if there was a better designation of landscape quality in local plans. I, I think it's a good idea. Um, I mean, there was some debate when the 2018, now 2019 framework came out about whether the revised wording in relation to valued landscapes meant that you had to have some kind of either local plan or statutory designation in order to qualify as a valued landscape. And I think it's not been decided by the courts, but the received wisdom is that's not what was intended. Um, but it does seem to me to be, um, it, it aids predictability uh, and obviously follows the from a planning perspective it, it gives way to the plan-led system if if valued landscapes are to have their value recognized formally in that way um, but, and that's with a sort of more streamlined approach to planning generally if, if i can just interject of course we used to have local um and regional landscape designations um and 
then we were all fighting um, for the white bits of land that didn't have those those designations and what the criteria were. There was a whole, so so we lost those. And, and I was one of those people who read the, the the latest iteration of you know description of what is um, a valued landscape and the relationship to hierarchy, and simply said, well, well, this is designations coming back, because how do you have hierarchy if the only hierarchy that some authorities now have are nationally designated landscapes because they complied with the previous um, requirements to get rid of local landscape designations. So we have, we're, we're starting to come round for those of us who have operated for many, many years, we're back to, I'm afraid, where I started my career. Um, so it would be interesting to see if there, but the idea was that the character approach to understanding landscape meant that you were designing to reflect the character regardless of what value was placed on it in a, by a designation because you were getting the right output and i think that's um it would be interesting to see what happens because because I, I i i do think that the way the mppf is written is, is i wouldn't be surprised to start seeing those local designations or regional designations coming back. Can I just add to that? Um, uh, to answer the question, I think, yes, they, they, they should come back. Um, the problem isn't identifying designated landscapes of different hierarchies. It's recognising that that isn't enough in itself. And that, um, and those immortal words, landscape, all, all the countryside is, is valuable for itself. And when I do a, a, an LVIA, I always try to uh, describe the landscape value that comes to either residents, people who use a footpath, people who can see it from a car, um, from seeing a site as a part of a wider landscape. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I'm particularly keen to take landscape sensitivity and split it in two. And so use looking at susceptibility when it comes to determining impacts uh, and looking at landscape value as a single feature. It's capable of much, much more consideration. Hmm. Is there um, agreement, there's a point made by Jackie that um, on an allocated site, that should effectively sort of change the baseline. I mean, if a site has already been allocated for development, um, should that not be reflected in your initial baseline assessment that development will occur? Any views on that? Who are you asking? Sorry, I'm, I'm currently, or one of my colleagues is currently reviewing an LVIA produced by another company. And they've essentially said that the site is allocated for, four, I'll say, 450 houses. But because their client is putting up 420 houses, that it's a, a beneficial change. And we don't, I've actually never seen, and I might be, you know, my, you may all disagree, I've never seen an LVIA where the baseline is referring to that, the built development, once the allocation has gone ahead. I've never seen that before, and we're in a, quite a quandary how to respond. Hmm. Well, pick, picking up the points uh, made by Charlie and also by, by Tom, do we feel collectively that change should be seen as more neutral in more occasions and that development doesn't equal bad and leaving everything as it is, is good? Um, should we move away from that polarity in the way we look at development? Any views? I agree with Charlie, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, th I think if, if we are, it's hard to actually, I, I suppose, for us to say, if you put the, the wider agenda of the landscape into things, if we're importing 40% of our food and we're building over a field that's producing food, it's rather hard to stay neutral about it, I suppose, if you take a sustainable approach to development. Tony, can I come, can I come back on that as just a thought? It's, 
It's interesting because I think Charlie cited a spectacular building in terms of Blenheim Palace um, and then also other developments. So within AONBs, we have cherished towns and they are conservation areas. Within conservation areas, we have cherished buildings, which are listed buildings. And they're all assets that we enjoy and revere. And at a point in time, they were built. So part of that in weaving in the beauty response is how do we get to a point where we're building uh, townscapes, places of a similar quality that in the future they too can be revered? And how do we use this tool that we have uh, in our hands to understand the landscape, to then shape the landscape, which is Claire's point, to get to the outcome, I think, which is Charlie's point, as opposed to change. So I suppose that's sort of partly an answer, partly a question. Can I, can I pick up on that? And one of the examples I used was a sort of slightly varied version of the case I worked on with you, as it happens, <laughs> the AOS, um, oh, in a number of cases, is that often by focusing, this is a wider point than just landscape, but it's relevant to this debate, that by focusing on the principle, is this a good thing in principle rather than this is a bad thing? those objecting to a development have ended up in a situation where they've ended up with a bad development. So, for example, I can think of, I don't want to sort of say too much, I promoted quite a few of them, but often um, I can think of one particular development which was on the edge of a conservation area in a sensitive landscape, and all the, the debate was on the principle, you know, should this happen or should it not? And, and my client won that debate, and what you've now got is a fairly ordinary, fairly vanilla volume house builder development in an area that actually would have benefited for something with a high quality design, high quality landscaping, etc. But um, the eye had been taken off the ball, and I think, and that go, I think that chimes with a lot of what's been said both by you, Andrew, and by others before about um, should we perhaps focus a little bit more on the how rather than on the if. Tony, Tony can I come in there? Tony, yeah. could I just add to Andrew's point? Because Andrew yeah. brought up beauty again, and I just wanted to make the point earlier in the presentation that we actually don't talk about beauty almost at all um, in LVIAs. And unlike the architects' prof profession that have really taken the bull by the horns with the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission, you know, who have actually began to think about beautiful buildings. We aren't really, we don't have the language around beautiful landscapes in quite, in quite the same way. And perhaps that is something that we need to, to progress. So to answer sort of Charlie's point about the positive, you know, what does make these places uh, beautiful? Not just in their sort of their visual quality, but in the way that they materially contribute to, you know, what we as a global society want in terms of food, housing, nature and all the rest of it. And so, you know, we need we need to probably up, up our game a bit in thinking about sort of beauty and good design in a much broader and more sustainable landscape resource heavy way rather than just the visual approach. I think that's a really good point, Sally. And there's, there's a sort of underlying philosophical question really about how prescriptive or laissez-faire should Glivia be. And obviously I wasn't involved and I don't know uh, the discussions that were had when Glivia 3 was... Um, formulated but my understanding and please do correct me if i'm wrong is it's deliberately sort of hands off and deliberately tries to leave as much um, discretion to the professional to exercise their own judgment and i think part of um part of my thesis and actually part of what you were saying sally as well might be well let's have a, perhaps a little bit more nudge in the, in the next version and perhaps a little bit more steer without you know removing it to discretion altogether so this can all be done by robots that's not what I'm calling for, but let's have a little bit more steer, a little bit more nudge, um, which which may achieve some of these beneficial outcomes we're talking about. I, I would also add that this sort of understanding beauty, existing beauty, and and how you respond to that also comes from the at the moment we're back ending the process in, in my view where we spend a lot of time on the nuts and bolts of the assessment criteria and thresholds and that side of thing. Whereas actually the baseline, a lot of the time I see nice big extracts from published character assessments, which are possibly um, relevant or certainly have some relevance, but haven't really got into the grain of the context of the site you're looking at. So it, there's, there's the sort of the weight of analysis that occurs at a desktop basis, which should inform 
much more detailed analysis in the field in order to understand the baseline issues relevant to take forward in the design. And that, that means you start at the very outset of the process, and for some projects, they go as far as outline applications, but you, you start understanding the broad parameters, but then you can refine those that, that information informed by the baseline. So I think our energies are so intrinsically tied up with the mechanics of processing and uh, reporting and uh, classifying significance that we're that energy if it was put at the front end in the understanding the place the the natural beauty the visual issues the the components that make that landscape appear as it does feel like it does it's understanding that and i think at the moment and it's not necessarily because of Libya itself it's it's because we've all had our fingers burnt because we've written moderate and then someone's come in and gone no it's not it's major and, and the inspector said I agree with that side rather than that side so we spend our whole time debating the words and not debating do you really understand this landscape and is this really the best solution you're going to get here mm. totally agree uh, can I pick up a comment by Paul Reynolds, which is a, a real one, I think we've all probably dealt with it. When you're designating a site for development, but you don't know what's going to go on the site particularly, um, whether you can use LVIA to try to make an assessment when you really don't know the physical form of what's going to go there. So you're trying to establish development in principle. Um, I mean, we've had to do this where we've actually had to write an architectural design code to, to, as it were, to underpin our assumptions about what's going to be built on a site, because all we know is they want to designate it for development in the local plan, and they want an LVIA on it. So uh, has anyone else got a view on the, perhaps the prematurity or the inadequacy of trying to uh, do an LVIA when you really don't know the physical form of what's going to go there? I think, from, from my perspective, um, I think this paragraph one point three actually of the current Glivia, which is about when do you undertake an LVIA? Um, you undertake that process as part of an environmental impact assessment or as as a component of a development proposal and planning application. So so the actual LVIA process, the what significance am I going to attach to this part of the process is is not for the allocation, but the baseline analysis, which informs parameters, which informs the context for change, that that part, which we sort of don't feel that we can do the baseline unless we're going to go all the way all the way to the end of the process. But actually, that bit, and that's taking the published character assessment, taking the understood views, and actually defining what are the parameters, what if. If, if we need to accommodate development and it has to be somewhere, first of all, where is the best location? And if it's going to be here, we all agree because of avoiding other potential problems or access, access and um, sustainability, all those sorts of things. If it's going to happen here, what are we going to do? What are we going to set as the framework? Um, it makes the role of the sort of the, the local authority landscape advisor very exciting because you have that influence very early on on the on how development could proceed. But I think sometimes it's allocated, it's got a policy that says numbers and road and where a junction's going to be. And it it is so so silent on what are the defining features of the character which are going to influence the outcome. I think you can say something in broad terms about the suitability of certain types and scales of development uh, to certain landscapes without having a plan. You know, housing covering Helvellyn, you don't need a, a plan of it to know that it's a bad idea. Um, so I think if we see LVIA as this iterative process that we would like it to become rather than the advocacy document that it now is at the end of um, master plan production, um, then I could see how uh, LVI as a process 
would co come in, as more information came in, would help with site selection to begin with, and then as uh, development was firmed up, would work with uh, designers so that um, the key features of a site are identified and uh, retained. Um, I mean, one thing that's happening at the moment, and people have talked about looking at LGLBIAs in silos, as it were, is the government's produced uh, a national design code now, and it's out for consultation, the uh, national model design code as well. So we've got a, two documents linked together, which are meant to be guiding local authorities in the way they produce design coding for future development. So it may be that our concerns that something may occur, which would be all right if it was well designed, but not all right if it was badly designed, there needs to be, the government would say, place your trust in our other legislation that we're bringing forward. Uh, would, would that obviate some of the objections, as it were, because we're going to be asked to trust to future design coding? And then we've got a view. I've designed coding before, years ago. Um, the Countryside Agency worked on that. I, can I can actually go back a few steps as well? I mean, because with development, when, I mean, GLVIA is very much, it's a methodology. It's in a way policy, well, it is policy neutral. So that's just one of the tools in the box that you use when you're planning development. I mean, we've got national policy statements, we've got the NPPF, we've got local plans. And if the local authority's on its feet, we're gonna have um, design briefs too. Um, so all these sort of policies and things influence where development goes. And obviously when we have landscape character assessments, they're going to influence local plans, design briefs, and landscape and visual impact assessment. And again, when you're looking at development, I've got to stress that you're looking at not just the visual aspects of the area, you're looking very much at landscape character and the characteristics. You know, you're looking at the what harm will a potential development have on those key characteristics. It may, it may, they may not be harmful. That would come up as well, but. So, so the landscape and visual ass assessment should be very much an objective assessment, sort of based largely on fact. And ideally, if the landscape and visual impact assessment has done well, you know, the same result should um, occur, whether it's being done, say, by a local authority landscape architect or a private sector landscape architect. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, there's um, a question, just how do people see this idea of mitigation? Is it, do you take a scheme and then effectively look at it and promise mitigation in the future, which was Sally's concern about one of the aspects of whether it's done at all and whether it's done well enough. Or So where does mitigation sit? Should it be built into the design? So effectively, you actually have a good design. You, you even if do you have to document that it started off badly, but because of the intervention of the landscape architect, say it's now a more acceptable scheme. So it's been pre-mitigated effectively. I think. Well, I think built into that question is the point about terminology, because mitigation is itself, uh, as indeed is impact a loaded term it suggests that something's inherently bad and all you're doing is to minimize how bad it is whereas actually some of in the right scheme in the right place something which which would colloquially be called mitigation could be actually part about part of achieving high quality design and i'd say the same point about impact i mean to be fair glivia tends to not use the word effects rather than impacts but impact suggests immediately that it's necessarily negative yeah but, but surely, surely, Charlie, the people that the people who are making decisions about um, the benefits or the disbenefits of the scheme are the local authorities or the planning inspectorate or whatever. You know, as landscape professionals, we're making technical uh, judgments about landscape. So, is it really for us to be to be weighing housing need and other things 
That's not what I'm suggesting. I mean, if I can link that into a question from from uh, Edis, which, which says, well, you know, should you take into account the nature of the use in considering landscape and visual impacts? That's not what I'm suggesting. Uh, I mean, otherwise, it, you'd have the perverse scenario where a let's say a 30 unit scheme, the the landscape and visual impact assessment or LVA, um, would have a different conclusion depending on whether it was a 100% affordable housing or a conventional scheme, and, and that would be perverse if the if it looked the same. Um, and it had the same footprint. But what I am suggesting is that there ought to be greater clarity in Glyv in a future version of Glivia that, in principle, a scheme of that nature, regardless of its use, if its use could, in principle, in the right place, done the right way, be neutral or positive rather than necessarily negative. That's all I'm saying. Um, the balance is always for the local authority, but it does seem to me there's a there's a real risk that the landscape profession will be seen as operating in some kind of parallel universe. If in any case, you're only asking yourself the question, how bad is this thing which government policy is saying we have to have somewhere? <laughs> but, but Charlie, Charlie, I'm surprised. I'm surprised. Sorry, Claire, just very quickly. I'm just surprised that you're talking about adverse impact because from all the, all the sort of LVIAs I'm looking at, the impact is minor or negligible, or in some cases, positive. Slightly positive. So I I don't recognise this idea that LVIAs are coming up with a major adverse impact because that's not what we're seeing. It's, I mean, that's interesting. It, it may be that we are, our experiences are different. I, mean, I can only speak from my own my own experiences, um, but mine are very much that when you're dealing with new um, new built development on green fields, that it, it invariably um, the conclusions will be this is adverse, and the only question is how adverse um and and even if the, the the other people's experiences are different it does that even even if that is the position does that not suggest that there's not quite enough parity as the approach taken in these circumstances because otherwise we have a degree of unpredictability there may be you know your tomato is my tomato should we not have a little bit more steer that in principle this kind of development could be good done in the right way in the right places just add there. For local, for you, for you're talking about development that hasn't been sort of allocated on a site within a local plan. So you're going for sites that nobody's identified as a site that's suitable for housing. Not, not necessarily. Um, I mean, the example I gave was an allocation. Um, I don't think it necessarily matters because the effect is the effect, regardless of whether it's been allocated in a planning document. No. No. No, if it's been allocated in a local planning document, therefore it will have gone through all the various filters. Um, well, n not necessarily. So it sounds as if the sites you're dealing with are quite contentious ones. Um, well, I guess that's necessary. <laughs> it, in a sense, necessarily, because I'm accusing it, that that would almost uh, be is um, the the appeal success rate for contentious sites, many of which are contentious because of their landscape and, and or visual impacts, is at 30 or 40 percent at the moment, and that's a real reason, um, a, a real real contributing factor why the government's target of 300 homes enshrined in national policy isn't being met. Um, so um, it, it, it don't think it's an answer to say, oh, well, this is only a contentious site because the contentious sites are, are a real part of, uh, or a main part of the problem. Can, can right. I just come, come back on two, two points? The first is the GLVIA3 um, dealing with this mitigation, paragraph 4.26, which is that the add-on, the cosmetic landscape works are really sort of the least desirable. It is about, you know, the, the point I'm making is, is about actually embedding the right outcome from the very early stage. And, and also in that paragraph, it does say it should be remembered that well-designed new development can make a positive contribution to the landscape and need not always be hidden or screened. So it is in there. This is, this is chapter four, which I don't think gets um, brought out very often. But the, the point on allocation, which I think is quite interesting, the, the simple application of a policy to allocate for development doesn't take away the character or the sensitivities of the site anyway. Um, it may be that 
the susceptibility is somehow being established, the susceptibility of that location to development is at the lower end of the scale, and that's why it's been allocated. But its, its constituent parts, its qualities are the same regardless with or without allocation. So those, those features which should be embedded and infused through the master plan or whatever development you're doing uh, should happen regardless of whether it's been allocated or not. It shouldn't be a, well, now we've got allocation, we can just get on and do it. It should still be the best outcome that we can get because we do have to make sure that if we're going to develop on our natural resources, we get the best out of it and don't waste that because we have the flip side, which is the natural environment we also have to be looking after. So it is that tension, but I don't think allocation makes a difference to how you should approach the the consideration of the issues and the design outcome. Yeah, must be right there. Otherwise, we end up with a situation where um, potentially an allocated site can end up worse than an allocated site because not enough attention is, is given to it. I think there's also, I think that Claire, both, I mean, all of you have been making really good points about understanding place and um, in particular Claire talking about understanding place. I sometimes feel that um, despite the, the good words that we all have, and this extends way beyond the whole LVIA um, process, and indeed LVIA does give tacit acknowledgement, you know, more than that, so I don't mean it like that. I mean, it's, it gives acknowledgement to the fact that uh, landscape is, we need, to, we need an integrated approach to landscape to understanding places in 2.15. Um, but I think that sometimes we're on the back foot trying to think about harm rather than thinking what good, what positive can come out of something. And I feel that um, we, we really need to sort of have a, a thorough understanding of place. And indeed, we need to sort of think in, in a, I don't, I think that we probably so, almost subliminally sort of inhabit different silos. We need as, you know, environmentalists to sort of, you know, we are all environmentalists to be coming together to be able to sort of present a synthesized understanding of places. And if we look at uh, time as a factor, as, as sort of history as a factor in landscapes, um, every square inch of every landscape was exploited. Um, you know, our tree population now is far older than it ever was, for example. And we might, um, you know, I've seen so many assessments where they might sort of say, well, we need to retain, um, retain this feature or that feature without any understanding of the functions, the functions that have actually underpinned landscape and given landscape its, its beauty and its function. And you, the idea, the very idea of utility and function were felt to be inextricably linked. Um, I, I, utility and beauty, I mean. Um, and I feel that, you know, we need to sort of get to an understanding of both utility and beauty working, working together. Mm. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, can I just interrupt now? We can carry on talking as long as people want to stay. I mean, people are free to leave, as it were. But um, could I ask you, Mark Fangerican, to, to speak a little bit more from your knowledge about the process and where you think it's satisfactory or where it may go with these changes in government policy that have been flagged up as part of this planning for the future? Um, I'll try. Um, first of all, I have to declare it an interest. I've spoken with Tom in the past about it. I've spoken with Sally in the past about it. I've not had the chance to directly speak with Claire about it. But Charlie and I spoke also, initially planned for a Friday evening, five o'clock, and then he had to postpone it. And I said, that's just typical a lawyer who can't get any inroad against his witness and therefore holds you over in Perda at the moment. So, um, particularly the last 15 minutes, I think we've actually slid off the debate about guidelines for landscape and visual impact assessment, which is what the debate was um, It's also very much focused at, um, as an initial response, on, on, on issues that clearly play a major role in planning decisions in England. The guidelines for landscape and visual impact assessment has to apply to all home countries, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland as well. And I understand there's a lot of issues to do with housing and um, 
I can also understand that, um, and it's certainly supported by the Lancet Institute, that they must look at these issues very carefully and not readily take any position or another. The guidelines for landscape and visual impact assessment are a compromise in terms of the methodologies that every landscape architect would want to apply to his or her work. That was the case with version one, that was the case in version two, and that is the case in version three. Because they are guidelines and they're asking us professionals to interpret them, to use them as appropriate, to vary them, to apply them. But they are not prescriptive. Landscape and visual impact assessment is not something we can design a spreadsheet for and, and fill in. I'm not suggesting anybody proposes that here, but it is not something that is easily undertaken. Landscape and visual impact assessment, I think everybody will agree here, is requiring a lot of expertise, skill, and experience. That's not something you build up in two years. It requires a lot of guidance. And um, it's one of the key issues. The panel on guidance on the DLBA is focusing on that we must improve standards across the board. From the Landscape Institute point of view, biased assessments, blatantly underestimating or blatantly advocating, are not the desired effect of the of the of the landscape and visual impact assessment. Not at all. The objective of the guidance is to help um, undertake good quality landscape and visual impact assessment, which give a clear picture of the likely effects, neutral, beneficial, or adverse. I'm not going at that. That are likely to be the result of the development. That should inform the decision making. One of the problems, of course, there is that a lot of local authorities haven't got access to, due to their budget being cost, haven't got access to landscape architects and their services anymore. So challenging, perhaps, incomplete or incomplete assessment is become more difficult, and therefore maybe the authorities become more defensive. More and more information is being asked. So the, it's a very fluid world. Um, there were comments earlier on which refer to, I think, um, Edward, in your introduction, you refer to the various documents that's coming out in supplement to the assessment. And the latest indeed being um, how to review a landscape and visual impact assessment or a landscape and visual appraisal. Mm. And the purpose, the, the reason why the panel uh, put that out is to say, well, there is justifiable criticism. I've seen several landscape and visual impact assessments that are be below par, long way below par. And nobody, we, we have no power, either as this group or as the Landscape Institute, to, to do anything. We can strive for better training, better application, share, sharing of knowledge, and a debate like this can be sharing of knowledge indeed. But as a start, we, we suggested that if you have questions on it, Follow this procedure. Try it. It's on the website. It's been on the website this whole time. And you can get an objective view of the, um, create a, quite an objective view on the quality of that particular, particular assessment. That is the first step in what I would want to suggest within the Landscape Institute to go into a much more demanding level of skill for landscape and visual impact assessment. Um, Turning back to a comment I made earlier again, a compromise. It will always be a compromise. There has been so much debate about GLVAA2 that it was too prescriptive. People filled in the table, minor there, minor there, so it's, or it's low, medium, high, low, medium, high. Hey, presto, we're in the middle, moderate. And then some people made the choice to make it either significant. <coughs> I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. I, I, I trust you understand that. <coughs> um, GLVA3 deliberately didn't give such direct guidance. 
it's focused on trying to instill in us a, a, a need and a, a wish to become very clear, reasonable, logical reasoning. It was, and there is a lot of judgment in that, indeed. But there's nothing wrong with judgment necessarily if people can understand on the basis what, of what you make that judgment. Um, perhaps that doesn't satisfy the courts, uh, it's obviously I'm not familiar with, but that is the background for GLBA. Um, policy compliance, yeah, I understand why um, you, you might want to make a guidance in, in response to policy. But it's a planner, the planning officer or the planning committee who needs to follow that, the national policy and the decision maker in due course. It is in the view of the landscape, in, in my view as a landscape architect, not the role of the landscape architect to stray into policy in any way. And therefore separating it out from policy by keeping the policy out it altogether because the process, the, the requirement for an objective independent assessment is the same irrespective of the policy. May I put it in the concept of renewable energy development? In yeah. Scotland in particular, there is a lot of that. Marcus has alluded to it a minute ago. Cumulative assessment is a real problem. And what we are searching for there, I, I, I suggest, is improving our methodology consider new uh, uh, cumulative effects of wind energy development in, in, in the UK, but tested first in Scotland, no doubt, that, that any guidance or any development of guidance. But it will not, I expect, have Scottish na Native Scot and National England and Natural Resources Wales, leading to say, well, because it is, um, there's a strong policy support for it, we make it easier to get consent. It, it may, it may, it will need to provide better information what the result of the increase of development will be. I'm probably speaking far too long, so I, I, I think I, I really welcome this debate, but, but it needs to move away from the, the fairly detailed level where we were 15 minutes ago, because that, that is. Whilst it ultimately will be relevant, you were talking, you started talking about, does this book need changing? Does this guidance need changing? Not about what we'll be discussing in the public inquiry. What, what do you think though, um, I mean, the government has flagged up in the planning for the future white paper that it wants to speed up or make the assessment process simpler and presumably give it quicker results to facilitate development because that's its agenda. So do you think there needs to be a response to that to work with government or are we going to effectively be told something by the government which will affect the way we operate? As a profession, we need to have our best uh, leg forward. It's a Dutch phrase, but put your best, I don't know whether it's an English phrase as well. Um, we need to have the best response as a profession to retain ownership of this subject so that we can give advice to clients what the um, what our best professional advice is. So yeah, we might need to give a response, but is that, I don't know what it is. But also, as I mentioned, the, the GLVIA, which is, covers all sorts of projects, we've now got a separate paper that I think that you, you authored about residential development. Um, no, no, it's, it's, it's not a paper of the residential development. Technical note, yeah. It, it, but it, 219, yeah. Yeah, it is, it was an attempt and it is an attempt and it's guidance that's out because in many developments, especially again wind energy developments in Scotland, the um, visual effect of a wind farm on local dwellings or on dwellings close by was increasingly considered at inquiries and in determinations. Now, we all know that residential um, impact assessment or residential effect is a planning judgment. But the residential amenity is made up of several components, as I understand it, and I try to explain the guidance. Namely, visual effects, effects on visual amenity, 
and the effects on noise, dust, light. Now, these are technical skills that we don't have. The visual effect and visual amenity effects are skills we do have. And it is to try and help people coming to uh, informing a judgment on that, ultimately informing a planning officer or a planning inspector what the conclusion should be. It's not, it's not about residential amenities, about the visual amenity component only. But this, I mean, it seems to point out in the guidance often is that for a GLVIA assessment, you look at for, uh, a proposal from a public viewpoint, whereas the residential uh, assessment is from people's private spaces. So um, is there a tension between these two? There could be, but if you, if you look at the guidance, the guidance suggests that uh, you may want to contact the local people who potentially are affected and go and visit their property and, and discuss it with them even. But you still have to make an objective assessment what the likely effect on the visual immunity might be, and you could give a judgment. Okay. And, and all you. this guidance is purely out there, including the GLVA, to help improving quality. On that quality note, um, this is a, a question for Sally. I don't know if you picked it up, really. When you've been assessing the LVIAs that you've seen, is there a, a, do you know whether the people doing them are qualified landscape architects? Or um, how, how far is that a factor in the quality of the things that you're looking at? Can you determine who produced them? Yes. Yes, Tony, the answer to that is yes. And unfortunately, all assessments I've looked at were produced by CMLIs. Right. Um, and as I've just responded, not a single one of them treated landscape and visual uh, impact equally. Uh, and unfortunately, all of them used negatively weighted scales. So I'm afraid not looking particularly good in terms right. of the, the group that I've looked at already. And I've still got more to look at. But yeah. OK. Edward? Um, <clears throat> could I um, talk? I, I know very little about the subject. On one, on, on, on a sort of technical point of view, but just looking at it as at um, Blenheim Palace, for example, and Vanbrugh, um, I think it's. I think Charlie's point is, re and, and which Claire um, made the point, which I would advocate hugely, is basically it's, um, it's it's what is eventually delivered, which is the most important of all. And with, with Blenheim, I mean, you had a, a, an architect who was extremely skilled, and obviously with a client who had a deep, or the, the nation had a very, very deep pocket. But coming more recently to the building in Milton Keynes, um, which was, you know, a really large new town um, done in the 1960s. I mean, there was a team of designers, and I, I think I'm right in saying, um, Peter Walker was the mm. chief designer for, for that. Yeah. And it, you know, it had a huge amount of uh, public um, engagement in, in the sense that the drawings, the plans, etc., would, you know, presented and certainly all the, in the, in the, all the architectural magazines, you know, the vision of Milton Keynes, I mean, it was pretty seductive at the time, I and mean, just putting aside the whole Kai issue. And therefore, it was Claire's point, it was the, the quality of actually what you were going to get at the end of the day, which was one of the real driving factors. And that the, I remember the drawings, which were the landscape drawings were done, I can't remember the band, it was an American, he did these beautiful drawings of, I mean, they were absolutely stunning, of the existing landscape and the, the, and the proposed landscape. And I, and I feel that basically this sensitivity to the landscape is something which is immensely important. Um, and talking very personally, that when I've been working in very sensitive um, locations abroad, I've spent a week just drawing the site and um, making drawings. And from these drawings, one would present the drawings to the client. I mean, I, was, I worked in um, Syria and I present, presented the drawings to the, uh, uh, the British ambassador. Um, and essentially, it was building up a confidence with the client, stroke the, the, the planning authority, through your understanding of, of the site. And, and I think, I suppose what I'm really trying to say 
is I think that the personal engagement of the designer to the site by spending three quarters of the time on the site, drawing, making notes, etc., and the remaining time actually filling in the forms, one might get a much more responsive uh, contribution. Mike, thank you. Um, another question for you, say, someone said, um, can you explain the meaning of negatively weighted scales? Um, yeah, just the negatively weighted scales are those that um, have more of the sort of low, minor, negligible, for example, um, uh, criteria against moderate and high. So there's a tendency if you're thinking, well, OK, the effect of this is sort of like middle, moderate, or rest of it, that you would pump for the middle of your scale. But if the middle of your scale isn't actually moderate, it's actually minor, or low, then that's a negatively weighted scale. And so therefore, when you then combine that, as a lot of the ones I'm looking at do, through a sort of table where they're averaging um, to you know, a negatively weighted and a balanced scale or two negatively weighted scales, you get, uh, it's easy to see how you can sort of like nudge your, your sort of final result downwards. Right. Just sort of yeah. share with what Sally's saying, what tends to happen there is um, some landscape architects doing that by, they do that by basically um, pulling down the value of the, of the site or the area. So they'll, if I use the term fudge, don't get upset, but basically they'll fudge the value of that site or the various receptors. So they're undervaluing the value of the site. And so that pulls the, the weightings down. They also lower the sensitivity of the landscape receptor. So they'll say it isn't as sensitive as it really is. They'll also underassess the magnitude of the landscape effect. So this is why I'm saying you might get two different landscape architects working for different clients. One might be working for the local authority. One might be working for the developer. And you might come up with different results because of the way they've looked at, say, the value of that receptor. And what I've seen is a, quite a lot of landscape architects, sadly, doing these LVIAs sometimes don't even acknowledge that there's an AO or AOMB or a national park on the doorstep. Is that Some the... don't even show them on the maps, which is shocking. I mean, Chris, Chris, is, quite, quite, Chris is quite right in that the area where um, this is most uh, prominent of the assessments I've looked at is in terms of magnitude. So if you've got size um, and scale and extent, mm. Um, it's usually in the extent where there's most um, opportunity to sort of, I don't know, fudge, as you suggest, the outcome. Because what's happening is you find the receptors used are much larger than the site itself. So it's easy then to say, well, OK, it's only going to affect a small part of this. Oh, it dilutes. Yeah. Um, therefore, it's going to be um, a sort of a minor impact. But of course, if you're dealing with something like grassland, as a as a material resource, it affects all of that grassland. Well, it depends especially if it impacts on the drainage, say. Yeah, in you perpetuity. Know, yeah. So yeah, it, it back you can see how you can weigh those slightly differently to get a different result. May I take it back to the guidance? Tom very clearly stated, and I spoke to him about it in the past, that he thinks there's things in the guidance which are flawed or, or, or not well set out or, or, or don't work very well. Uh, so he's got a qualitative critique of the guidance saying, I think that is not fit for current purpose. That bit of guidance should be done differently. He talks about sensitivity to bring it together of susceptibility and value, which is indeed in the guidance. And he says that doesn't work. So he's got qualitative comments on the guidance. Sally, I totally agree with you that there is there's several examples, loads of examples of people misrepresenting things underestimate the effect. That is not the purpose of the not as the, not necessarily or, or even at all caused by the guidance. It's caused by 
people being under pressure perhaps by the clients to, 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 to do certain things, or misunderstanding the, um, the guidance, or not being trained properly, or a combination of all the above. And the flip side is that there has been occasions that developers get asked for disproportionate amounts of information and assessments, which are, are clearly also important. These are all issues that are affecting our work, but are not at the core of our work. As landscape architects, I believe we have a responsibility to act in the, in the interest of the landscape that we are common stewards of on behalf of the, the people of the UK or, or, or of Europe or the world, for that matter. We are not in the pocket of anybody. Sorry, Charlie, I called you a hired gun the other day, and, and you said, yeah, that's what we are. You can be a hired gun, but I am not. And um, that is a fundamental difference. We must, we must work on the quality of our assessment. We must build on increased training, skills, and experience. Um, we maybe should be looking at forms of accreditation. You will remember that the Institute of Environmental Assessment set up an accreditation scheme. You can be a member of the organization, but to be an accredited assessor, you have to comply with certain minimum standards. That, that assessor status is currently held by about 60 practices in the UK out of 2,000 or 4,000 members. That tells you something about the standard that's required. Perhaps the Landscape Institute should consider going that way. Accredited Landscape and Visual Impact Assessor. A starting well, point, I have alluded to it already, was drafting that guidance. How do you review an, an, an environmental, a, a Landscape and Visual Impact Assessor? So the debate must concentrate on guidance and how we can best take information for decision makers forward. Not what information do we want to pay for? I, I, I think to to add to that and the, the review document. I and mean, I, as some of you may know, I am now a sole practitioner, and I am actually in sending my work to other chartered members. Um, I think there's someone on the call now sending my work to them for them to review. I and mean, I think we should be bold enough to invite that and um, embrace the fact that we want to. So no, I, I don't mean I'm passing it to a colleague who sits on the other side of the desk who's who, who's in my pay, but somebody who will give me an honest feedback. And I think we should embrace that as an opportunity. But I, I do go back to the fact that there's eight pages on the design process, the relationship of the design process, and 26 pages that's they're both sides so it's double that obviously on the process of assessment that doesn't include the cumulative assessment part as well so i do think there is it's it's up to us to use the guidelines but i think it's us to, up to us to understand where the emphasis might be better placed in terms of our time and investment in a project to to do all the good things that we're all talking about to deal with that the legacy of our role in the landscape, as well as the delivery of immediate priorities, which may come through policy. Can I ask a question? Um, it is, um, you did a written, I'm not sure I picked up on your question adequately enough. Was, was the speakers answering your, your query, it is? Your... Um, in terms, well, the question was more sort of on the policy side and obviously that was the way it was answered was the policy is necessarily going to be a consideration in and of itself or sort of the housing side but in in the mechanisms which are provided within the guidance to sort of allow for um sort of housing considerations on on the green belt too if the circumstances arise to allow them to become sort of positive or neutral considerations So in essence, it was answered, yes. Is it right? I, I mean, it obviously tends to be that building on Greenbelt tends to be a land use planning consideration rather than visual. Um, 
there seems to be a feeling that there needs to be more tuition in schools to train people in the skills as well. I don't know whether people feel it should be part of the uh, normal curriculum for training landscape architects if it's not there already. Absolutely should be. Yeah. Of course it sh- of course it should be. And it's, it's I think over the years it's gradually diminished, unfortunately. Mm. I, mean, I, I have to say, just when when I was in my last couple of companies, recruiting landscape planning consultants as opposed to yeah. design um, members of the design arm of the profession. And I, I I don't want to silo us, but I understand that we all have a mm. sort of different bent. But but it was really challenging because they the 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 colleges were not necessarily providing that component of the totality of landscape as part of the sort of standard mm-hmm. curriculum and I, I think that's you know it, it's all very well designing something but <clears> if you get the wrong site to start with your design is, is not going to be enough so they, they, you, you have to start from the, the roots in my view it's not, it's not mean, considered totally. it's not yeah, considered sexy is it we, we need to make sure as well that people are actually going out on site because I think what if you Ed, would to, were talking about out on site abroad, you know, and just getting the feel for the place and being able to sketch, and it, it's 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 how students can get an understanding of landscape character and what should inform site planning and good design. Well, I think <clears throat> exactly. I mean, <clears throat> maybe I put the point across rather bluntly, <clears throat> but I spent all my life. Um, painting and drawing landscapes and sitting in a landscape for, you know, two or three hours, just very still. It is amazing how much sensitivity you can accumulate by just, you know, doing things slowly. Um, if, if, you, if, you have to, if you send out from your office, because you're a landscape architect designer, but there's no design work, to go up Ben Lomond to assess that wind farm, that's, I, I understand what you about to say. And and um, and when what and what happens is that you can build up a uh, confidence with, with with your client and also the planning authority by by showing that yes you have been drawing on windy conditions or or even your drawings have got rain all over them. Um, but I, th- you know, I'm just really repeating my point. I think that. That as a profession, and I think with our education, I think we've lost, well, there's a tendency to lose this direct sensitivity um, towards the landscape, which we should be magicians of. We should be. We should be, absolutely. We should be drawing when we're on the hills. We should be feeling the wind, sensing the weather. But we also have to write an objective Landscape and visual impact assessment. I wasn't and saying one or the other. I'm saying yeah. both. Yeah. Um, is that well? We're, we're pretty much at the end of two hours now. I don't know if people have had enough. Um, it's difficult to necessarily draw conclusions. It's been a useful debate and hearing everyone's views. Um, some themes come out um, such as like having better education would be an important factor that. Uh, people go through the process. Um, I mean, report writing itself is a skill, and maybe not enough of that is taught as well. It's always the quote from, I think, an engineering course at Loughborough that said, when I came here, I couldn't spell engineer, but now I are one. Um, (laughs) And it's, you know, and and I've read a lot of LVIAs where the methodology takes up pages and pages before you get to the meat of it. You're thinking, well, could you get to the conclusion? All I'm reading is extracts from the guidelines, you know, and I think yeah. this could be an appendix. I don't need all of this, how you did it. I'd like to quite quickly get to the end of the process. Um, also, perhaps design integration is an important factor. So maybe it's not the failure of the guidance, but a failure of its application because we're not seeing it um, integrated into um, a better design through an appreciation of the factors that have been assessed as as part of the assessment, as it were. I mean, I've seen that as a design review panel member where there's a tick in the box and people have done all the baseline and they've noticed that there's slightly sloping and there's this vegetation here. Then I look at the development plan and you just like being on a flat site. It's like we've ticked off all the bits 
Now let's go on and design it the way we want to. So I, I've seen myself a lot of disintegration between the baseline and what is actually finally delivered. And obviously we need to do that through better training as well. Um, I have to say, I think there's going to be, ch I would be so surprised if the government doesn't intervene to make the planning process quicker and faster and easier to determine because that's what it wants to do. Uh, and it's got an agenda to build, build, build. So I think we would be very surprised if we don't see some form of change in the way LVIAs are structured or incorporated in the evaluation process, which may worry us because it's part of a big planning review, which is trying to make development easier and quicker for everybody, We're allegedly with more certainty, but it may be only the AONBs and national parks, etc., that enjoy the greatest protection and everything else is to play for, which is a worry as well. So um, I think it's interesting to keep talking about this and see the direction it goes in when the government responds to all the comments we've made on the new planning white paper. This says it's going to be the biggest shake-up since 1947. So it's probably not going to be evolutionary. It may well be revolutionary in its effects on the planning system. And we will have to play our part in trying to still produce the quality of work that defends the spaces which we value really uh, and also the other point that's been made about cumulative assessments um, i think there are some different views about whether it has been used or hasn't been used in order to try to evaluate big schemes appearing over time um, with mitigation perhaps built in or it, do developers take bite-sized chunks to then have to try and only do small scale assessments rather than the big assessment that comes at the should be at the beginning so i think we have to keep um improving the way we use the guidelines but uh, still be open to the idea that maybe change may be necessary and may be beneficial um as well as um everything else the government is throwing at us to say that they were going to control design even more centrally um through design codes to local authorities as well and uh, our concerns about designs are going to be taken care of through other policies. Mm. So, um, every, we don't have to go, um, say, but I think uh, those who want to go and probably getting hungry or need a loo break or something, happy to go now, but we can carry on talking. Well, I, I have to get, get go, but I, I just wanted to say from a Landscape Institute Technical Committee and guidance on GLV panel point of view, we are open to discussions about whether the issue has to do with the guidance and requires clarification or amendment or updates or not. Yeah. We're open to that. And, um, but it's not something that happens within two days. There is a lot, just for everybody's information, there's been, the, set, the webinar has been held a few weeks ago and there's been a workshop being held just two yeah. weeks ago. And there is a lot of raised points raised, yeah, and they are all being mapped out and will be discussed much more widely. Well, that's good. We well, need to, we need to keep this dialogue going because as you, there's been a lot of informed, very well informed opinion as part of this debate, and um, hopefully that will continue to inform the direction in which GLVIA um, occurs for the future. Yeah, because yeah. one thing we should not do is undermine our own profession. Yes, I mean, I can't see that as we've left Europe now and we don't have the directive presumably in force that things are going to change radically. I think um, GLVIA will always be a part now of our planning system, but it may obviously slightly separate in its direction from any direction that happens in Europe. Yeah. Well, I think, because I, I, as you've said, a lot of the LVIAs and EIAs are much too long mm. and I think there's a word I quite like and it's called obfuscation <laughs> and what tends to happen with these documents you know the real assessors the local authority practitioners who are getting few and far between from a landscape architecture point of view find it very difficult to sort of see the wood for the trees and as you say there's an awful lot of repetition in these documents too and a lot of it's excessive padding and yeah. whether that's because the people can't write reports succinctly 
or it's because people are trying to sort of tie the local authority assessors up in knots. That's perhaps open for debate. But I think practice does, does need to be improved. Yeah, I think I think some cases you're right. I mean, it, it, t it tends to be that the um, people almost weigh the report rather than read it. You know, if, if a client wants to know what he's spending his money on, he, you know, you pack it full of all this methodology, which confuses them. But it says, fine, if that's what you've got to do, that's what you've got to do. But it helps justify the fee. Um, yeah. I, say, I, I think in many cases, you see, you wade through this methodology and you think it should be a technical appendix or lost somewhere. You don't need to wade through that to read a good report. No, that's right. But I just agree that there's there's a lot of clutter and noise in many LVIAs, and yes, you don't want to wade through a methodology to get to the actual assessment and so on. On the other hand, the uh, volume of information that goes into an LVIA is sometimes a product of the process that Claire was talking about earlier on, mm -hmm. whereby um, fingers have been burnt by not having covered everything to, down to a level of minutiae um, or, or, or to, to what is perceived to be the appropriate level. And therefore that tends to raise the volume of the content of, of the uh, reports that follow on. So, you know, and that accusation of not having covered can come from the local authorities uh, or the planning authorities. So, so Christine, whilst I agree with you that it then becomes difficult for local authorities. At the same time, they're very often responsible to a large extent for the volume and content. Mm, of yeah, them. I agree. Um, I Charlie's agree. got to go. Um, just say thank you very much, Charlie, for your much valued contribution and um, hope we can stay in touch as things develop. And thank thank you. you very much. Charlie, you. I'd, I'd be delighted to, to take this discussion forward with anybody who's, who's interested. So, sorry I have to go, I've got cross-examination tomorrow, not on landscape. Uh, 